Welcome to session four, the story of Doxodeo. Uh, in Mark chapter six, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. In that story, there are principles that have helped us as a ministry. Uh, moving from concern to compassion, we've said, is the changing of our mentality, where we think differently about church and about our engagement within the world. Secondly, Jesus breaks up the group into 50s and 100s, and we see a strategy. And so we prayed, Lord, give us strategy to better understand how to impact our world. Together with that, we have this incredible privilege of uh, uh, taking what God has blessed us with in one city to 12 cities. There were 12 baskets. Remember, they took those baskets somewhere else. Somewhere else, someone else was blessed. And that's what we've trusted God for, that what God has started in the city of Pretoria through Doxodeo will be taken to other cities that will bless regions. And we also recognize that the principle was not to try and start something big. You know, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It is small, but it grows big. I've seen people trying to do initiatives for God and start very big and see them end very small. And then I've seen people who really hear God and, and just start to break the pieces, small pieces, but then it grows and becomes a very significant ministry. Well, there is a fifth principle, and this principle we see where Jesus speaks to the disciples just after they've now fed the 5,000 people. Jesus says to them, go over to the other side. Now, they didn't want to go over to the other side. Uh, the other side was the unclean side. The other side was where the seven nations of Canaan had settled. It was the pig eating side. It was the heathen side. And a good Jew never went over to the other side. If he had any engagement with people on that side, it meant that he was unclean. And when he came back to the Israel side where the 12 tribes of Israel were, he had to go through a cleansing ceremony. So here they are. I mean, they're so excited. They've just seen this miracle happen in their own hands. And they're high-fiving one another. And Jesus looks at them and says, guys, go over to the other side. You just see the challenge this has for them. Because this is not the first time Jesus wants to take them to the other side. If you read... Mark chapter 4, you see Jesus says to the disciples, we're going over to the other side. They're very concerned because you see they had the superstitious sense that if you go over to the other side, bad things can happen to you. They had this omen that, that you can be deeply affected if you go over to the other side. But Jesus says, go over to the other side. So they get in the boat, and Jesus heightens the tension because the Bible says he goes to sleep in the boat. Now they're rowing to the other side. You can just imagine the conversation in the boat. We shouldn't be doing this. Why is the rabbi taking us to the other side? Then the storm comes up. And when the storm comes up, this storm suddenly for these fishermen is different to any other storm they've ever encountered because in their minds, the storm is evidence they should not be going to the other side. When they awaken Jesus, they accuse him. And they say to Jesus, do you not care that we perish? It's as if they're saying, why are you taking us to the other side? Well, Jesus gets up. He quietens the storm. They cannot believe what they're seeing. They actually say to each other, what manner of man is this that he speaks to the wind and the waves? Well, the storm quietens down. They get over to the other side. 
When they get to the other side, there's nobody to meet them. Remember, those people and the Jews did not engage with one another. So there's no welcoming party. There's no engagement. There's nobody there except one mad guy full of demons running between the graves. And Jesus sees him and he turns to the disciples and he says, that's our guy. <laughs> I can just see the disciples. You know, this is a trip to hell. I mean, this is just getting worse and worse. Why would he want us to engage with the mad guy? So they get in all of this mad guy, drive out the demons. You know the story. These demons go into the pigs. The pigs, by the thousands, have a mass suicide. They all die. It affects the economy. Now, if you affect the economy, you get the attention of the people. So the people of the region come down to Jesus and the disciples, and they are angry. And they are saying to Jesus, get out of our region. We don't want you here. The guy that has just been set free, standing there, he's so excited. He looks at Jesus and he says, can I go with? And Jesus looks at him and he says, no. I always felt so sorry for him. It's like, Jesus, he just wants to join the team. You could have just welcomed him in. But Jesus was so smart. Jesus knew he had just found the key to a whole region. Jesus says to him, I want you to go to every town and every village. Go and tell your story. Now you've got to understand this was very different to the way Jesus engaged every other person on the Israel side. On the Israel side, when Jesus healed somebody or set them free, what did Jesus say? Don't go tell your story. Don't go into the city. Please don't go tell people what has happened. Here Jesus has a different strategy. Jesus says, go and tell your story. Go to every village, every town, go tell your story. Jesus gets in the boat, goes back with the disciples. The disciples are so grateful. They get back to the 12 tribe region. And now they see miracles taking place again. Amazing things are happening. They've just fed 5,000 people with a boy's lunch. I mean, they are ecstatic. And, and they look at each other and Jesus calls them together and says, Guys, go over to the other side. It's like, what? And by the way, Jesus says, I'm not going with. So here they get into the boat, <laughs> and they start rowing to the other side. It's a beautiful story. If you go read that, the Bible says Jesus went up on the hill. His eye was on them all the time. But you see, Jesus was actually training them, equipping them. Getting them ready to understand what it would mean to go outside of their comfort zone. Go outside of that which they felt secure in. He wanted to train them to engage the other side. As a matter of fact, so many times if you read the, the Gospels, you will see how Jesus was always taking the disciples outside of their comfort zone. He had to go through Samaria. He did not have to go through Samaria. There was a shorter route. Jesus had to go. Why? Because he was training the disciples. Come out of your comfort zone. I want to take you to the other side. We see how he engages the Syrophoenician uh, lady and, and how he engages. He engages her in dialogue, and the disciples are confused. The Samaritan woman, they're confused. He's constantly trying to get them to understand the other side. And uh, here Jesus says to them, go over to the other side. Now they're in the boat. Now they're rowing. The Bible says the wind is picking up again. Now can you imagine the conversation in this boat? It's getting dark. It's midnight. Jesus decides at midnight, he's going to go over to the other side, but he's going to take the direct route. He's going to walk on the water. Okay, now you're going to just imagine this. I mean, these are disciples. They understand water. Here, Jesus comes walking on the water. And the Bible says Jesus wanted to pass them. 
When they see Jesus, they say it's a ghost. Jesus says, no, I'm not a ghost. Me, Jesus, I'm going over to the other side. He wanted to pass them, but Peter spoils the program. Peter gets out of the boat. He starts sinking. Jesus has to save him. Get back in the boat. You know the story. They get back to the other side. Now they're on the other side. And if you go read that portion of Scripture, you start seeing how the rumor starts spreading that the one that said the demoniac free is back. It's not long when you see 4,000 people gather. Jesus had found the key to a whole region. And these 4,000 people are sitting there and he's ministering to them and teaching them and, and praying for them and setting them free. And it's an amazing moment. And then they recognize the people are hungry. And they say, we have to feed them. And then they feed them and they pick up seven baskets. Well, it's not long they're back in the boat and they're going back to the Israel side and Jesus makes one of these big statements that the disciples never understood. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And in essence, what Jesus was saying, watch out for the Pharisees because they will intimidate you and not allow you to go outside of the comfort zone that you're in. But he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now the disciples come together and they're trying to figure out what does Jesus mean? And the Bible says, it's a beautiful story, he's listening to them. And they come to this conclusion, there is no logic in this conclusion, but they come to this conclusion, we forgot the bread. And Jesus hears this and he says, guys, 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 come here, come here. And he sets them around him and he says, guys, let me ask you a question. He says, when we were on the Israel side, remember now, 12 tribes. We fed the people. How many baskets did we pick up? They say 12. He says, you're right. He says, and then we went to the other side. That's where the seven nations of Canaan settled. That's where the heathen settled. It's called Decapolis, which means 10 cities. But it, they knew it was the seven nations area. And he says, how many baskets did we pick up? They say seven. He says, and you don't understand? And they didn't. And I must be honest, neither did I. I read that scripture many times. I had no clue. Like, okay. And then I read further because I didn't want to say that I don't understand what it says. Until one day, John Ortberg opened up the scripture for us. And he said, you know what? What Jesus was saying to the disciples, he was saying, guys, when I fed the, the 5,000 and we picked up 12 baskets, it was more than just feeding hungry people. This was a prophetic statement that I am the bread of life for all the 12 tribes of Israel and there's enough of me to feed all of my people there's enough of me to feed all of the church there's enough of me to feed all of us that come together that know we belong to the family of God but he wants to take us to the other side and teach us that he also is the bread of life to the heathen to the unclean to those that are far he feeds all of them as a matter of fact Jesus was trying to say to them this side that side it's all my side wow when we started to discover this we recognized that maybe we have made a distinction that is so clear that is keeping us from asking the question lord what are the keys what are the keys that you can give us to unclean spaces, knowing that we will be able to represent the bread of life, the very essence of Christ, to our community? As much as we can trust God to be fed within the community of faith, could we also trust God that, that we could break the bread 
within the context of our everyday world. And so we started asking the question, what is the other side? Who do we need to go and empower? How do we need to reach out to, to our world? And one of the things that we recognized was that we needed to get the church mobilized to understand this concept. Because if the church only gathers as a group of people trying to isolate ourselves from the world and does not understand that we have been empowered to reach into the world, we see more and more people saved who trust that they will go to heaven, but we're not fulfilling the mandate of Christ in the world right now. And so we we created, as Doc Sadeo, this City Changes Movement. And the City Changes Movement is the mechanism that we use to reach out to churches all over the world and empower them with a very simple paradigm of ministry. And this is what we communicate to them. We say there are three things that God is busy emerging within the church as we know it today. The first thing is a clear understanding of the gospel. We need churches across the world who will better understand the good news of the gospel. And let me just say this. We know that good news is only good news if it is good news. You see, the slightest measure you infuse into the good news, any bad news changes it that it's no longer good news. I've listened to people share the good news, and it does not sound like good news. Folks, good news is good news. But good news means People need to discover they are included in that reference. Uh, a friend of mine phoned me to tell me he had good news. I said, so what's the good news? He says, oh, they found gold on my farm. I was on the phone with him. I said, well, that's good news for you. Unless, of course, you were thinking of including me in that reference. Then it becomes good news for me. Otherwise, it's just news. And for many people, the gospel message is just news. It's not good news. And so we have to help churches to understand, to communicate the good news. What is this good news? We have been included in the death, in the resurrection, and in the ascension with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ included us in the greatest moment of history. And so we're distributing a book that helps people to better understand that. The book is called, not do, but done. And it's so wonderful that we could put that on a video series. And all over the world now, people are starting to run that as a course to expose people to the understanding of the good news. Uh, I can just ask you to celebrate with us because this book has now been translated into 10 languages. <laughs> 10 languages. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated the translation into Romanian language. And um, it's now also translated into uh, five local languages here, English, Afrikaans, Zulu, Pedi, and Twana. And we want to distribute that book as much as we can, free of charge, to leaders across the nation and the nations of the world. It's translated into French, into German. It's now also in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, in, in Urdu, and uh, soon to be in Norwegian. 
We are grateful that we could empower leaders across the world with a basic message of the good news of the gospel. The second thing we want people to deeply understand is empower and release your people. Empower your people to understand their calling, to understand that they are city changers, to understand that God has anointed them to be instruments of grace within their world. You see, they're not just coming to church to be encouraged and blessed. They're coming to church to be equipped and commissioned and sent. And, and gather people together in different disciplines to trust God for impact within society. We have to trust God to create catalytic moments for people to be released into a greater sense of calling. I was just reflecting on, on a, a story just this week when I was thinking back to an event we had at our Ferry Glen campus, which is kind of situated in an area where there's a lot of medical engagement. And uh, uh, we felt that we wanted to bless everybody that was involved in medical practice one day. And so we had this service where we invited all the specialists, doctors, dentists, nurses to come to this uh, meeting. And uh, I preached on healing saying, you know, there are three things about healing. God wants us to make adjustments, to live a, a healthy life. Uh, our lifestyle must reflect that. Secondly, we partner with medical practice because God uses them to fight the same devil that we do, and we trust that God works through them. And then thirdly, the miraculous. We trust God for miracles to happen in people's lives. He is the giver of life and the miracle worker. And so we then invited all of these doctors and nurses and medical people to come stand in front and we prayed for them. And while I was praying for them, to commission them, to send them to go be instruments of grace within the city, an idea came in my mind, wouldn't it be incredible if these people today as medical practitioners could pray for sick people? Well, the moment I thought about it, I immediately rejected the thought because I was saying, Lord, please, no, this cannot happen because I know some of the guys standing in front here, some of them don't even pray loud for their food, what to say to pray for people who are sick. I thought, you know, they're medical people. They know too much about what is wrong with people. I can't expect them to have faith for healing. But the thought didn't leave me. And so as I was praying, the prayer became longer and longer and longer as I was fighting this thought about allowing these people to pray and realized I'm not going to get away from it. So I stopped and I said, you know, uh, guys, as you stand in front here, I have this thought. If you want to go sit down, you're more than welcome. But if you want to stay, we're going to invite people who want prayer this morning for healing to come forward. Well, all of them stayed. I think a little bit of pressure, but they stayed. But then the surprise, how many people just started streaming out, coming forward for prayer? I saw some of them walking to the doctors that were treating them, standing there and these doctors laying hands on these people, starting to pray for them. It was such a surreal moment of grace. What really bothered me, however, is how many people came out. I mean, I had given prior to that opportunities for people where I said, I will pray for them <laughs> as the man of God. But here are the doctors and the nurses, and here everybody comes out. I mean, it's... And God was speaking to me and saying, that's what I want. That's when the body starts to function in their gift, in their calling, in their purpose. It was two weeks later, I ran into one of the specialists who was in that meeting. And he started speaking to me, and tears rolled down his cheeks as he spoke to me. And he said, Alan, I want to tell you, something dramatic happened in my life that morning. He says, since that morning, I'm finding myself wanting to pray for my patients. 
interceding for people, calling on God to engage in a way that I've never sensed in my life before. And I realized, Lord, you've created a moment for city changes to be released into the city. Wouldn't it be amazing if church after church after church could see this vision? We're trusting God for that. To release their people to go into their other side. Thirdly, we want to deeply touch communities. And so we're teaching people how to think about community, how to think about spheres of society, how to think about the lostness, the pain, the brokenness of a community, and how to navigate in a sensible way, trusting God for impact. And so what we thought would just be just a platform of dialogue has become a massive mechanism to stir the global church so much so that we've just released a book called City Changes where we document this story and it's now going to be available also here in South Africa but across the world you can download it online where it documents the story of Doxideo and we trust that this will help many other ministries globally to become part of this incredible engagement, Christ's mission on the planet, the greatest agenda on the earth. And every one of you are part of that. May God bless you as you truly rise to carry this torch, this mission, and we will together see the doxa of Deo, the glory of God, fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. God bless you.